It's the Hero Show. Welcome to the Hero Show, everybody. Starring the irrepressible Andrew Bernstein and the reconstructed Robert Begley. I am I am Andrew Bernstein, and you are indubitably Robert Begley. How you doing today, Robert? I'm feeling reconstructed, Andy, because uh, today's hero we're going to talk about was a big part of reconstruction in America, but he's similar to George Washington in the sense that he saved the country, led the country to victory in war, and then right after that served two terms as president and presided over a very turbulent transition and by popular demand. Several people have requested, we read your emails, by the way, when you send them into us and U.S. Grant, that's who we'll cover today. Unconditional Surrender Grant, that was, as he, yeah, that well, at, right. West Point, mm-hmm. he, at West Point, he was known as Uncle Sam <laughs> Grant, right? <laughs> that but too. He, yeah, and then <laughs> another similarity to Washington, Robert, is didn't, didn't, he, didn't he say when he, the day he left, something like the day he left the White House was like the, the happiest day of his, of his day. career or something? Yeah, happiest yeah, something, day of something. his life, yes. Mm-hmm. It's like, so like, mm-hmm. I, think it was, I think it was Gary Wills who dubbed Washington a virtuoso of resignation. Uh, Grant was also because he was popular and, and could have run for a third. I think the Republican Party wanted to nominate him for a third term, didn't they? And he, you he know what, we'll, well, just... Spoiler alert, we're, we're going to do two sessions on Grant up to right. right before his presidency. And then we will cover that because, Andy, he actually did run for a third term afterwards. Not He took later, uh, four later, years not, off. That's right. That's right. And then they pushed, they, they persuaded him to do that. But uh, but today is all about the things he's most, most known for, which are as a general. Yes. And uh, why don't we start at the beginning, though, as we yeah, you saw at the beginning, Grant States were 1822 to 1885. So unfortunately, he didn't have a, a long life. But, you know, in the 19th century, uh, before the advent of antibiotics and, and, you know, and such, life expectancy wasn't nearly yeah. as long as it is today. So uh, and he died of throat mm-hmm. cancer, as I recall. Um, but yeah, OK, right. now you know a lot more about Grant's life than I do, Robert. So why don't you uh, why don't you jump in and uh, sure. OK, well, and, you know, so about, tell his, his name by birth was Hiram, H-I-R-A-M, Ulysses Grant and named yeah, after I'm glad they changed it. I'm glad they changed it to Ulysses. Hiram doesn't just Hiram doesn't have the heroic sound of a conquering No, it general. doesn't jump out. It, it <laughs> but doesn't Ulysses, jump out. And even Ulysses, yeah, they got that name. But by putting it, putting a bunch of names in the hat, the, the parents were asking, you know, what should we name him? So they, they, the Hiram came from the father-in-law and then Ulysses by, by popular appeal and certainly does have a hero quality yeah. about it. Ulysses is the Romanized version of Odysseus, isn't it? That is right. And Odysseus, is, right. Odysseus is certainly a towering hero. We do a, we'll do a hero show episode right. on him one day. Uh, we should. I think we should. So uh, Point Pleasant, Ohio is where he's born. So it's going towards the Midwest. And he had the, the, the family, though, uh, really interesting because his ancestry dates to Massachusetts, 1830. His family came on one of the early uh, voyages. And uh, great-grandfather yeah. fought in the French That's and right, Indian six, War. Six, 1630. Massachusetts Bay Colony, you mean, right? Did I say yes? Thank you for correcting me. Did I yeah, say eighteen thirty? Yeah, sixteen. You might, you might have. Sixteen thirty. Yes. Yeah, I think sixteen thirty. I mean, yeah, Massachusetts Bay Colony. That's yeah. early, that's early. Those are early days, but, you know, in colonial that's times. That's a long. Yeah, it's a long time yeah. ago, and uh, it wasn't the Mayflower, but I think it was like the William and Mary or something. One, one of those real early voyages, and right. Uh, grandfather, great grandfather fought French and Indian War. His own father um, was active in politics, staunch abolitionist. Right, right. And wanted um, wanted his son to. He, he owned a tannery uh, for horses, and this was one of Grant's uh, initial loves in life, uh, being around horses. But he didn't really like the smell. And um, 
So, so, but one day when he's eight years old, and this comes from his memoirs, highly recommend, by the way, uh, Grant's memoirs, got the audio version where our friend Robin Field actually reads. Uh, reads ah, it. yes. Uh, yeah, and he's, he is, he is talented. Is, so Grant is eight years old. Okay. And his father, he wants, he wants a horse. Daddy, I want a horse. I want to buy this horse. And the father's looking at it. He's like, it's not worth more than 20 bucks. So I'll tell you what, go down to the guy selling the horse and offer him 20 bucks. And if he says no, uh, offer him 22. And if he still says no, offer him 25. So Grant goes down there and he tells the guy with the horse, he's like, okay, uh, my dad said I can buy this horse uh, for 20 bucks. But if you say no, I'll give you 22. <laughs> and if you still say no, I'll give you 25. <laughs> I think that's not a what real good horse trader, is it? Yeah, I would guess it for 25 bucks. He, he sold it for 20, he bought it for 25 bucks. And this was two pivotal things in, in Grant's future. One, yeah, we can see he's not going to be a successful business. He's not going to be a successful and business. And two, man. as you say, that. he's not he's not good at business. And those those were lifelong <laughs> traits <laughs> that just continued in his life. So, um, yeah. Another thing. Let me, let's make point, let me point something out, but Robert. Let, ahead, let's make yeah. point something out before you, before you uh, continue. I, I vaguely remember, you know, where we discussed the. Uh, I haven't read the memoirs of Ulysses S. Grant. I know, I know you have. Okay. Um, but but I vaguely discuss remember, you know, when we we discussed the heroes of Midway and turning the tide in the Pacific War yes. in the in the remake of Midway, two thousand and nineteen, maybe. Uh, I, I, I'm not a hundred percent, but I'm pretty sure that there's a scene where the orderlies come in to Admiral Yamamoto, the great Japanese commander, you know, his, his stateroom and it, he's got a, you know, he's called to duty. He's he's reading a book. He's a very educated guy. Went to Harvard, right? His English was very good. Closes the book. And I'm pretty sure the book that Yamamoto was reading was the memoirs of Ulysses S. Grant, which is I'm, I'm mm. like 90 something percent sure, which is just an interesting touch in the in yeah. the movie you know and, and and shows how military commanders or naval commanders uh, were fascinated by the exploits you know and the accomplishments of, mm -hmm. of general grant so uh yeah that's that's just 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 Absolutely. an aside here about about the memoirs uh, yeah. his memoirs and how they're still relevant you know how they're still relevant in today's culture and again, we'll talk more about that next week when we do talk about the memoirs and what he went, the heroic effort he goes through to write them. So he's, uh, his mother's Presbyterian, his father's not, not really religious. And the good thing from Grant's perspective was he never really embraced religion. And this was a lifelong, lifelong, in fact, his son later on would consider him as an agnostic, which is interesting in the 19th century, which was a very religious uh, period sure. uh, in America. You had all these, all these different kinds of denominations coming out of the, uh, out of the woodwork. And when he's 17, yeah, his father enrolls him in West Point. He doesn't think his father can see he's not cut for business. So maybe right. military. <clears throat> And he's small. He's only five foot one, 117 pounds when he goes into wow. West Point. And uh, he does, this is where they mistook his name. He had Hiram uh, Ulysses Grant, but they put Ulysses and then S there. And uh, that was the name that stuck. And they called him for Uncle Sam. That was. Yeah, they, yeah, they called him. He was known as Sam. He was known as Sam when he was at West Point, right? That's right. That's right. And um, he US, didn't Uncle even Sam, excel. Yeah. <clears throat> he didn't really excel there uh, at West Point, but he, he would spend a lot of time studying literature. He would paint. So he wasn't the rabble rousing kind. He was always more thoughtful and um, kept his emotions close uh, to the vest. And one of the <clears throat> cadets at West Point that he befriended. His name was uh, Fred Tracy Dent. And eventually, yeah. uh, Grant met his sister, Julia, and, and they would uh, fall in love and marry. So he graduated. Yeah, and they, and they were a, they were a slave owning family, as I recall. Weren't that's they right. Dents? Well, part, and, that's right. So actually, I can, we can go on to the to to the marriage because yeah, and, and, and Democrats years yeah. later. 
Yeah, and Democrats, because it was the Democrats who supported slavery. I just want to say something before you continue. He also befriended yeah. Wonk Street, Wonk Street at, uh, at West Point. That's and right. He went on to be a very yes. famous uh, Confederate general you know, in the Civil War. West Point was a breeding ground at that time, you know, and a lot of these military heroes, you know, were in, were there at the same time as Grant. They, some had greater or lesser fame, but yeah, 1848, he marries Julie Dent against both parents. Both parents didn't want, and his, right, his right. in-laws did not even attend <clears throat> because uh, no, no, his parents didn't attend because they were staunch abolitionists. Her family were slave owners and Democrats, but they didn't think Grant was suitable for their wife because he couldn't really hold down the job and didn't really have much of a career that, that is, in their that opinion. Is a, that, is a, that is a problem. And by the way, this is yes. Julia Dent. Not, this is Julia Dent, not Bucky Dent, right? Not Bucky Lincoln Dent. <laughs> no. <laughs> It's chilly. Not, different family. Not different Bucky. family. It's chilly. <laughs> perhaps, it's chilly. perhaps chilly. Bucky. Uh, generations later, came from that side of the of the family. Uh, well, who hopefully, had Bucky renounced. Again, hasn't watched. Yeah. Hasn't followed baseball. Yes, baseball. <laughs> the baseball <laughs> reference. If, if so, Robin, mm -hmm. hopefully, the dead family had renounced slavery by that time. <laughs> yeah, I would. I would think so. Okay. They're okay. up in Boston. I would think uh, yeah. that they did right. that. So. Um, but one pivotal event in uh, in American history and in Grant's life is the Mexican War. So 1836, we have the Alamo, which happens. Um, um, you know, Americans are killed. And uh, the same General Santa Ana is running the country. And there are some border disputes. Texas becomes its own. It asserts its independence. And uh, between Polk and Zachary Taylor, there's calls for war with Mexico, uh, especially where the border is. And this was this war was important for several reasons. One was a lot of the generals who would end up fighting in the Civil War. This was like mm. their training ground uh, for right. the war, right? Including Grant, who was a quartermaster, and he learned a lot about logistics transporting goods from here to there. Um, he was in a few battles, Palo Alto, uh, and showed his bravery and his his staff uh, totally trusted him. And he kept grace under pressure, we say. He kept cool under fire. Another, another you know, if we look at parallels to Was George Washington, he had that as well. And uh, during the war, they even went all the way down to Me what is Mexico City, uh, the the Americans, and <clears throat> um, ended up. You know, they they found the treaty. Uh, it's interesting because I could say personal personally aside. In, in a prior life, I was married to a Mexican, and she would regularly tell me that most Mexicans wished America when we went all the way down to Mexico City. We just took everything. You know, we we just <laughs> took everything. Everybody would be better off. But an interesting aspect of the war was after America won, we gave Mexico fifteen million dollars. We paid fifteen million dollars to buy what would become uh, California and the 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 entire Southwest uh, up to our Oregon and uh, where now. Uh, Washington and Oregon, which were British territories. And this is unprecedented, where the victorious country in the war ends up paying and buying uh, the, these lands afterwards. And of course, one of the first things that happened after that was the gold discovery. So basically, gold stood under the bare feet of the Indians and Spanish for centuries until the American ingenuity found it, discovered it, and converted it into value, uh, valuable uh, mm -hmm. items. And and Grant was actually even even part of that. But as we spoke earlier, Andy, Grant criticized the the right. Mexican War. He he was definitely critical of it. Yeah, in part, he just thought I, it was. If, yeah. Let me see if I if I remember because although Grant was not an abolitionist yet. He was also not a pro-slavery guy. And he thought Never. that, yeah, right. 
right, his father, like you said, was a, a devout abolitionist. Um, he thought that well, a, a large part of the purpose of the Mexican War for you know for many of the of the Americans who promoted it was to spread slavery, you know, to acquire uh, territories that would become slave states. And of course, you know, he yeah. thought that was an immoral that was an immoral purpose to to go to war. Yeah. So yeah, I, I mean, I agree. Absolutely. I agree with him and about, he's about that. Yeah. And he's right. Yeah, that's yeah. that part. He's right. He's completely right about. And if you think of Texas coming in, Texas was the last. I think 1847 came into um, into the Union. 1845 uh, was Texas. Then California, um, 1848 was actually the first Southern state to join the Union. That was not a slave state. So this contentious issue was was playing out uh d right there during during grant's uh lifetime and so he marries uh while he's married to julia he's sent to these different posts far off he's in now northern california uh in the middle of nowhere and he starts drinking and a big thing if you know about grant is you know that he was considered a drunk he was known as a drunk that was a that was a part of his uh his reputation but there were there were a couple of fact a couple of reasons for this one he was very lonely uh especially when he missed you know he missed his wife and there was no real action so he was the kind of person that kind of needed some kind of external action to keep him busy, to be productive, to be somewhat at his best. And and, and let me see, let me see if I remember if I remember. Let me see if I remember correctly, Robert. When he was posted in California, I think poor Julia was was left home uh, a long ways away. When she was eight months pregnant at that time, wasn't she? When yeah. uh and yeah. so yeah, I could see why Grant misses his wife. He's not gonna see the the birth of, of his child. I could see why he'd be lonely and you know and unhappy and might might turn to you know, my turn to alcohol. I don't yeah. understand that. Yeah, and actually, if I could say, he was he was kind of like me. I don't, I don't drink. I don't drink anymore. But when I used to, one beer, and I was like, I would get a buzz, and and that's kind of how Grant was. He, it didn't take a lot for him, and then he'd somewhat be like a kind of like a happy drunk and and like uncontrollable. So that reputation never really left him. Uh, then comes the gold rush, which I had mentioned before, and he does the transport, which we had spoke about in the Vanderbilt uh, episode, through the Panama Canal and comes up through uh, uh, up the coast, of California. And in 1854, he is uh, under uh, Buchanan, is one of the uh, superiors in the military, and basically catches him drunk, and. Um, Grant says to him, look, I'll give up the stuff. In fact, if I, if you, if, if I'm ever drunk again, somewhat on duty, then I'll, I will resign. And that's exactly what happens. Uh, so he's out of the military now. So here's again, here, he's a man of his word. If he says something, he's going to do it. So the integrity of his actions, even though he might not can, be able to control this drinking habit, which again, some people attribute to his his father drank as well, and and some use that um, uh, that alibi. I'll, I'll call it for like. Well, you know, later term. on, it, later on in his career as a general and as president, he was enormously competent, you know, and very effective in his yeah. in his work. So he must have been able to keep yeah. his drinking issues under control. Yeah, yeah. Oh, oh, absolutely. Absolutely. And, that, and part of that was the fact of him being busy and having tons of responsibility. So, uh, so now we're around 1854, he's 32. He's a civilian. He has no income. And um, he goes back to the Midwest and builds his own home with his own hands, uh, which he calls hard scrabble and tries his lot as a farmer. Guess what? That's not working either. Nah, nah it, and, it didn't work. But it, and he built his old home. Is interesting. That's what that was the legend yes. that reputed to Abraham Lincoln, right? That Lincoln was that's born right. in a log that's, cabin. That's right. He helped his father. Yes, which is a neat trick if you could do it. You know, born in <laughs> born in a cabin that you helped build. 
that's that was the that, kind of regard people held true. Lincoln. You know, held Lincoln in that these kind of they had these kind of legends, uh, you know, mm -hmm. this myth, mm -hmm. myth, almost mythical status. You know, almost like an American tall tale, uh, you know, status attached to them. But anyway, so Grant actually yeah. built his own house, but he wasn't born there. Okay. Literally built his own home, but but wasn't doing well uh, with it. You know, couldn't really make ends meet. 1856 election comes. And here it's uh, James Buchanan, Democrat, is running it against uh, Fremont. And Grant votes for Buchanan because he thinks if Fremont wins, the South will secede. So he's basically four yeah. years ahead of his Fre time. Fremont was <laughs> Fremont was uh, yeah Fremont right Fremont was an abolitionist, as I recall. Fremont right? was an he abolitionist, was a, yeah, right? Yeah, he was a mixed case. Like personally, Grant didn't. There, there were other things. Grant other reasons Grant didn't vote for him, but yeah, he you could say Fremont here's was his a, chance to. He, he thought he thought Fremont was a shameless self promoter, right? That's uh, right. That's right. Yeah, yeah. So that being the case, he's like, no, I'm not. I'm not backing this guy. And and um, and then sure enough, yeah, the the Buchanan wins. The the storm clouds are brewing as far as the war goes. 1860, right before the war breaks out, Grant moves back to his his uh, tannery that his father runs in Illinois. He's working underneath his two younger brothers. Uh, you know, how can, can you hit more rock bottom than that, where you're just not cut out for civilian life? And we know what happens later on in 1860. Abraham Lincoln gets elected. The South secedes. Full year later, April 1861, Civil War breaks out. Yeah, but, but, but Robert, now, before we get into that, is, yeah, before we get, let's back, yeah. I mean, backtrack some because I forgot something. Sure. <laughs> when he graduated from West Point, 1840 something yeah. right yeah he was a, a you you touched upon this he was a master horseman i, I mean he had a way with horses yes. you know and, and he that's was, right and he could tame horses that other men you know couldn't which by the way is that's are, right. are also legends legends ascribed to alexander you know alexander that's the right great, alexander by, the great by, yep. by, mm -hmm. by Plutarch. uh so maybe military commanders you know have a have a way with with horses i don't i don't know but the army in its wisdom did not assign him to the cavalry, you know. <laughs> the army, the army yeah. assigned him to, to the infantry, and it's just I was reading right. about that the other day, you know, prepping for the show, and it, and it's, it reminded me what they say, you know, there are three ways to do something: the right way, the wrong way, and the army way. And so, you know, it's a, it's, 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 you know, <laughs> Grant was so good with horses. You think certainly he would have been assigned to the U.S. cavalry, but he was, he was, yeah. he was not. And uh, no, anyway, so, no. so, so, I don't, so, so anyway, civil so, war breaks uh, out. A, yeah, 1861. And he's an unknown. He's really an unknown. In fact, he's, he had left the military somewhat in shame. So Lincoln calls for, what, 15 million uh, people to volunteer and Grant throws his hat in the ring. He wants to be a commander, but that's shot down by Buchanan. And, um, but sure enough, uh, the war is going on the following year, 1862. This is, he, here is the pivotal moment. He's put into Tennessee. He was always good in the Midwest. That was because he, he lived much of his life there. He knew the terrain. He, he had, had an, uh, an eye for, uh, he loved maps. So, uh, all these, all of his um, better traits were starting to come to the forefront, and he was fearless. He was completely fearless. So there's two battles: Fort uh, Henry and then Fort Donelson that he's uh, fighting in. And he, like we talked about, Patton and other great commanders go on the offensive. It's it's interesting. Jo uh, George Washington is one of the few, but he, he for him to win, it needed to be a defensive battle. Yeah, he had a fight. He had a fight. Opponents were so much he superior. Had, yeah, yeah, they were. He had a fight a guerrilla a guerrilla war. But to, to your point, support your point, support your point, Robert. Uh, I know a lot of experts in this field consider Napoleon the greatest, uh, you know, the greatest military commander yeah. of history. And he was, yeah. he also preached. Take the take the offense, and so great a commander 
the, the Duke, Duke of Wellington, who knew something about military yeah. strategy himself, said Napoleon uh, as a commander is, is worth 40,000 men to the French. That's, you know, that's yeah. how great, yeah. that's how great a commander Napoleon was. So yeah, I mean, the, there's something to that. Keep your opponent moving backwards. You keep them off balance. So yeah, so, yeah I mean, that was, and, that was and grand even strategy. In the, in the Right. Even in yeah. the negative sense, Andy, Germ the reason Germany took over so fast in, in World War II was they, they went on the offensive and everyone else was well, trying to fight a de defensive war. And that just doesn't work. It, it simply doesn't work. So we get to Fort Donaldson and um, the opposing uh, general is Simon Bolivar Buckner. And what, what a Buckner, great name. Name, Simone right? Bova, Bob, Bob, <laughs> that's a great name. Yeah, yeah, exactly. So um, Grant has him trapped. And they actually have a history. They were together at West Point, and Buckner had actually loaned Grant money, <laughs> which Grant still owed him. <laughs> okay, on top of that. And surrender, so surrender, and I'll him. pay you back, right? Surrender, and I'll pay you back. <laughs> Basically, that's, that's a good deal. <laughs> <laughs> that is a good deal if you can get it, but yeah, right. um, this is where Buckner is assuming that the terms will be uh, mutually beneficial for both sides. The terms of surrender will be mutually beneficial, and that's where Grant says no, unconditional and immediate surrender. And here's where pivotal moment, first of all, we're already a year into the war. The North, the Union has not had a major victory. They're, they're mm -hmm. all um, uh, in chaos in the Eastern front of the war. The, the, and so when Grant says this, unconditional surrender, word gets back to the Northeast and the press, the New York press and, and the DC and the Boston press. And that's where they call him, un you know, unconditional surrender. Right. That's like his nickname for the rest of his life. And, you know, we went with this episode. There's the, that's what the U.S. stands for in America. Right. You know, any right. kid growing up in America with a good education, Andy, like you, you and I, when they actually taught history, we know what unconditional surrender means. It's one, one man. It's that simple. It's, it's Grant. And in part of the part of the description, he's smoking a cigar, and they start sending him a fan starts sending him get uh, cigars, which uh, ultimately, sadly, uh, pro very likely took his life because he ended up uh, getting throat cancer. But right. the direction of the war is now completely changed because um, word eventually gets to Lincoln that uh, Grant wins. He fights. And as he's rising through the ranks and starts winning battle after battle, his superiors are angry because even at Fort Donaldson, he went against his, his, the commander. He went, he, he knew, he saw the, the right moment to strike. And his commander was pissed off and complained to Lincoln about him. And what does Lincoln say? He said okay, something this, like, this I man. can't spare this yeah. man, he fights. Right, isn't that what Lincoln said? He fights. He fights. They, yeah. they even start the rumors about him drinking again, and he and you know they're digging back to his past. This is where I think his 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 uh, reputation as a drunk. It's really hard to shirk that when when people actually see it. But I don't think he drank during during any of the successes. I, I don't have any evidence from what from what I've read. Yeah, and by the way, Ron Chernow. Has a massive book on on. I recommend that as well. Massive book on uh, Grant uh, as well. But yeah, go ahead, Andy. Yeah, it, it would be enormously difficult to accomplish the thinking, you know, the strategy and the tactics that a successful commanding yeah. general would, would have to do if he's on booze. I mean, it's just the booze clouds clouds your judgment. So you know, if he yeah. if he could do that, he's a better man than I am. You know, you know, uh, or, 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 yeah. or almost anybody. Uh, yeah. So I, it's it's it seems very unlikely. Yeah, uh, that's that's my observation as well. And uh, but then the flip side is, if the man keeps winning, don't 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 change anything. You know, yeah, right. 
-hmm. whether he's drinking or not just don't change anything he's he's still winning and let him battle his own demons yeah i i I know one of the um, well one of the major criticisms of grant has has always been that he lost so many men the casualties were enormous and they shiloh and and they yeah yeah yeah, and and other battles in virginia uh you know against lee where just the casualties were just you know mount mounting up and there's criticisms that i don't i don't know if they're well founded or not you know that grant was cavalier about the lives of of his men he was willing to lose yeah. a lot of men in order to win a battle uh very good point i don't uh, it's, it's yeah, a very i, I good don't know point, the Andy, truth and, about and, that because he was fighting he was fighting a a, a very effective army especially you know going uh, against he, robert e lee and a victory a few things. may not may not have been may not have been possible in any other way yeah. So Shiloh is the, is the first big one, 23,000. Yeah, that was a bloodbath. That was a and bloodbath, right? They're, Sh- yeah, they're Shiloh blaming Church. him. Yes. Yeah, they they're blaming him. They're saying he's a drunk and um but he was wait he was told by his superiors to wait for reinforcements. And he they weren't coming. Reinforcements weren't coming. So he he basically got trapped and and all these uh soldiers died. And so he actually was ready to resign after that. But Sherman convinced him, no, you, you can't, you, you have to, you have to continue because, uh, as many casualties as there were, and this would play out again later on in the, in, in the big Virginia battles, uh, no human life is expendable. I mean, we, we know that, but the union could lose more than the Confederacy. They, they, yeah. the conf- every death to the Confederacy was just, it, it was like almost a five to one ratio of how much the deaths hurt. Yeah, the, the South, this, the South had a much smaller population base. The big cities yes. were in the, were in the North, mostly. Yeah. yeah. Yeah, exactly. Exactly. So, so let me get to 1863, which is Vic- Vicksburg. And here, you know, I mentioned this, uh, prior in the Sherman episode where this was pivotal. It's the same weekend that, uh, well, there's a siege and actually Sherman was against uh, Vicksburg because it's 300 foot bluff uh, where the Mississippi is and it's very strategic and it's very hard to break through. So So the home team in effect has the advantage. And what Sherman does is he gets black labor pay and pays them to reroute the the put in canals and reroute the Mississippi and he's reading maps and he's he just finds a way to enter Vicksburg and there's a long siege like eight nine months long uh finally July 4th 1863 is when the uh South surrender uh, same exact weekend as Gettysburg up in yeah. uh, Pennsylvania is happening. Uh, so, <laughs> yeah, a lot of deaths, a lot of yeah. But, that, but from that moment, the the rest that's of a the major war, turning point, South, right? That's a major turning yeah, point. Was on the South, yeah, yeah. The South has no chance to win after after uh, for, uh, yeah. because Vicksburg now you know now now the Union controls the Mississippi and it breaks the Confederacy in half right there's they can't that's they, right. they, there's you, that's you, know, right. you got arkansas texas uh, you know west of the mississippi you know tennessee yep. and mississippi east of the east of the river and everything it's, it's it's split in half and union gunboats can control the river which is a major mm-hmm. blow and then lee's army at gettysburg took just ah oh, just staggering staggering losses and of course had a uh, there's any chance of besieging Washington D.C. Then is 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 gone with the wind, if I can quote Margaret Mitchell, and they have to you know re- yeah. retreat back into Virginia and fight a de- uh, fight a defensive war. At that point, you, the handwriting was, was on the wall. You could see you know this uh, a lot of lives could have been saved if if the Confederacy had just surrendered because they had no mm-hmm. chance of victory. You know at, at that point, yeah. but. Uh, but but anyhow, yeah. uh, it's it's it's, it's sick because we know yeah it's sad it's, because the civil war is the bloodiest war in American history because everybody it, killed on both sides was an American. That's right, that's right. So what's happening simultaneously is the cotton smuggling that's going on to the north. The north still wants cotton, and there are smugglers who want to um, 
get it up to the north and grant opposes this because he says you're basically you're financing you're funding the south or fight right. you're allowing them to buy bullets and all these other things that they will use on us so this is right. wrong right. and on top of that you'll gain military intelligence as, as part of this thing you'll be you'll be they'll be learning about what we're doing so he even knew you know intellectually that this is and morally that th this is wrong and it should it should be stopped well so, you know robert uh, you know those you know those jews though you know anything anything to make a buck right weren't weren't, weren't, weren't some of the speculators involved in this they, they, they were jews, they were they? they were and we'll talk next time about he how good he was uh he has a mixed yeah he has mixed reputation as far as the the, the, the jews go but because uh, he defended them in later on in life, certainly uh, in yeah, his presidency. Generally, generally, Grant's record in dealing with Jews and blacks was was very good, wasn't it? As, as a, and as and a, Indians as, a, as well. Yeah, yeah, that's right. Yeah. yeah, I don't, I don't want to sound like an anti semite. I mean, that was a, that was a, that was a joke, <laughs> you know. But yeah. some of some of those speculators yeah. you talk about were Jews, but you know, but many of them were not. Oh, they were. They, they, they yeah. were known as yeah. that. Yeah, and and. That's where that's where you look at the pragmatism, you know, the 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 evil of pragmatism as a, as a philosophy. That no, you go on the principle stand that you should not be having these, you should not be funding your enemies so that they can buy bullets to kill uh, you yeah. or to Absolutely. kill your you know your sons, your husbands, your. Uh, Abs this Absolutely is one right. reason it would be it, yeah it would be a hardship to do without cotton. But uh, as a matter of principle, Grant's right. And uh, you know, we saw it in, in World War II, as prosperous as, as America was you know, relative to other countries. The war effort required you know, uh, Ford and General Motors are cranking out tanks and uh, half tracks and, and trucks and Jeeps and stuff. And so it was hard to get an automobile. You know, then, and, yeah. and food was large yeah. amounts of American agricultural production was going to feed you know, uh, the, our servicemen. You know, and so food prices for civilians were higher. You know, but but that's that's part of a committed war effort to defend freedom against yep. totalitarianism. And it's the same. Grant is right. It's the same principle in the Civil War. So we'll, we'll have to we'll do without cotton. Uh, you know, it's be harder to get cotton clothing. Well, you know, so it's well, it's a uh, it's deprivation. But the moral principle here requires us to crush the yep. slaves, the slave society, and and yeah. reunite America entirely as a free country. Which is you know in, in accordance with its founding principles. That's the that's the the, the key yep. ruling point here. In fact, that's part. That's he learned early on that the South was not going to go quickly and easily, and that's where he even said Grant said this this is going to be a battle of this unless we it's a conquest this war will go on forever, and so after Vicksburg is exactly when Lincoln sees. Uh, what Grant is doing, and just you're the guy now. You, you know everyone else. I was that I was uh, fluttering around with. They're out. Grant, you're in. You go after Lee. <clears throat> Grant leaves Sherman to to do his business in the South. He's got Sheridan in in Shenandoah Valley. Sharon Sharon's another hero that uh, oh yeah you know oh, yeah. deserves great like, cavalry. Pretty much deserves Eight, his own yeah. yeah. Great cavalry commander. Mm -hmm. right. And so um, so Grant is going towards Lee. He's going to into Virginia where Lee is and more bloodbaths, more, you know, you have wilderness, you have um, Petersburg, which is where Lee was uh, holed up and dug in these entrenchments and and Grant's army for, you know, fell for it. So again, just a lot of casualties. Andy, I wouldn't say he, he didn't think a human life was expendable, but sometimes you take chances and not, there's no guarantees. And Lee was a brilliant tactician. They knew the terrain better. So all of these things resulted in the, the massive yeah, loss of yeah, life. It, yeah, the, right. The, the overriding principle is victory. We have to we have to defeat the Confederacy. I heard one yeah. story, Robert, that's that is perfect you yeah. know, on, on this point. When one of one of Lee's uh, generals told him he was certain that Grant was retreating, 
and Lee, Lee rejected that idea. He said, Grant is not retreating. Grant is not a retreating man, or Grant is not the retreating no. kind, or something, something, something like that. That's right. That's, that's, exa that's exactly right. So on his way to the Northeast, leaving the Midwest, he, he meets Lincoln uh, for the first time. And they're both impressed, mutually impressed with each other. They have they both built log cabins, right, Andy? So they got that. They got <laughs> yes, that in common. Yeah, that's that's right. <laughs> and that's right. And Grant didn't Grant consider Lincoln the greatest man he'd ever he'd ever met? Yes. I think yes, he, I think actually, he said that. Uh, yeah. Coming up on that uh, shortly there shortly thereafter. So all on all fronts, the North is winning. The, the South is, they're attritioning, they're, they're drained, they're, people are abandoning. Now when they see Grant, even the Blacks, uh, similar to what they did with, with um, Sherman in the South, they, they, they're embracing him. They're calling him a savior because guess what? He is, to a large extent, he, he's a human uh, savior. So April 1865, Lee is cornered and... Um, Grant is, um, he's kind of drained. He's got this massive headache. And he gets a note uh, from Lee basically saying, let's talk, let's meet at Appomattox tomorrow. And all of a sudden Lee's, uh, Grant's headache goes away. He's like, wow, it's funny. This is, uh, it's funny. How funny right? how that works. Yeah, better than yeah, Bayer. Exactly. Yeah, we, we can so exactly, advertise yeah. victory. Be as, better victory than is Bayer. better than Bayer. Yeah. So again, something all you know, all uh, Americans going. Elliot, if you could put the um, the second image of Lee and Grant, uh, uh, famous painting. Great painting. <clears throat> Who painted and, that, Robert? Who painted it? Ooh, it's a great painting. I don't know, but it's actually in Grant's tomb. There's a, that painting is in. Oh, is that right? Uh, okay, uh, it's, it's on the panel in Grant's tomb. So, so that and... answers the question. That's what's in Grant's tomb. This painting, <laughs> this painting of, of of Grant and Lee at Appomattox. And by the way, so we here's point kind out, of the before. Let me, the, let me point the something before out. Before and people, after. People, people, just let me point something out, Robin. You know, to people who aren't yeah. native New Yorkers. Grant's tomb sits up on the, you know, on the bluffs overlooking the Hudson, the Hudson River, near to where Howard Rourke built the started temple, I assume, you know, in, in, in fiction. But, they, but in real yeah. life, Grant's tomb is, is is there, and Grant himself is buried there. But, you know, it's 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 way out of the way. It's way up, you know, in the in the northwest, you know, uh, quadrant of Manhattan Island, you know, up the you know, George Washington Bridge. A lot, of, a lot of people never went there. Tourists often don't go there. Um, and so the joke in, for, you know, amongst New Yorkers was always, you know, who's buried in Grant's tomb? And there's a lot of people, a lot of people didn't know the answer, even though the name is right there in the, you know, is right there in the it's state. In the question. <laughs> yes, yeah, it's right there in That's the question, great. correct. Yeah, yeah. yeah. but I, I, I have been there myself. So so this painting is is uh, is in there, yeah. in, the, in the tomb? That's in there. I think it's like it's a replica in there. Like I, I, I'm okay. sure that's in a museum somewhere. But it's important the difference here, because Lee is of the old world, the gentry. The, he's dignified. He's got the sash. He's got the sword. He's perfectly groomed. Grant is mud. His boots are muddied. He's he, he hasn't bathed or shaved or anything in in days. And he rushes to go to Appomattox. Uh, he's from a poor, you know, hard scrabble background. So this is the future of America. What what this handshake is doing is it's tr right. it's saying right. the old way, the old way is done. That you know that um, it's gone with oh, the wind. It's it's gone yeah, it's with gone, the wind, it's gone, Robert. And it's totally and, and, gone and, with the wind. That society of the South, the gentry, the the mm -hmm. you know aristocratic, uh, you know, looking down uh, on others. That's over. Now it's time for the self-made rise by your own effort, where everybody's free, equal before the law. That's what this handshake is is representing here. So when they when they sit down and they start talking, yeah. Wait, just let me, Grant, say, let, me say I, yeah, let me say something. Let me say something. Let me say something about that, Rob. Yeah. Uh, because mm -hmm. you, 
Margaret Mitchell's novel is really a great book, uh, Gone with the Wind, yes, especially is. the first half. Yeah. It's a great movie. The second half is something of a soap opera, but the first half of the book and the movie is magnificent, magnificent novel. Yeah. Um, and um, yeah, I mean, she captures that. The book was published, I don't know, 19, she worked on it for many years. Uh, she was born and raised in Atlanta, right? The book was published, I don't know, sometime in the 1930s. Uh, but, in the uh, 30s, 39 was yeah. Gone with the Wind, the film. Right. And I think the book would have been published just a few years before that. And I saw a quote attributed to Margaret Mitchell having grown up in, she had, she grew up in Georgia. She said something like she was like, she was something like 20 years old before she learned that the South had lost the civil war or something something like that. But anyhow, uh, she captures just what you're talking about, Robert. And, and, and that's a really good, uh, interpretation of the painting. Uh, she captures it, you know, the characters of Ashley Wilkes and Melanie Hamilton represent the old blended gentry, the, the plantation system, the slave society, and the characters of Scarlett O'Hara and Rhett Butler represent the future, much more industrial, you know, industrial society, uh, not committed to the plantation system, not dependent on it um, anymore. And she captures it beautifully in, in that novel. And uh, you're right, that's the, the, the handshake here. Is, you're right. It's... Um, it's passing the torch, right? From the it's old passing agrarian. Passing the torch from the feudal. Yeah, from all the, that's right. Feudal, yeah, feudal agrarian, agrarian society to the future. Mm-hmm. To the industrial capitalist society. And, and for you, yeah. as a big uh, supporter of Alexander Hamilton, this is the triumph of Hamilton's yeah. vision. Hamiltonianism. You know, of a, of yep. industrial, I agree. Over, over, over Jefferson, you know, the agrarian. Yeah. Much as I admire Jefferson, the, the agrarian system is was is not america's future right the industrial capitalist urban uh, urbanization that hamilton yeah. envisioned was was the future of america and you're right this is i hadn't thought of it that way you're right this is the, the handshake symbol i think captures that it's a good point yeah and i actually good point andy you reminded me that also part of grant's advantage he wanted technology he took advantage of every technological uh, uh, opportunity so the railroads he learned about railroads and right. we'll, we'll right. even talk about transcontinental right. railroads next next time but that was part of his thing this idea of logistics and getting goods and men in and out he was just a master of, of that transporting so um yeah his early would, days as a quartermaster his early days as a quartermaster yeah. were very helpful here I mean, he knew what it takes. So he is where the Mexican War came in. Yeah, right. That's right. Provide an army. He knew how to give them supplies. And even as a kid, I, I didn't even say this, he he transported people on the horse. Like he he didn't like the tannery. Right. Right. He didn't like the, the smell and all that. So he would actually ride people in carriages and stuff as, as a little kid. And that was, you know, transporting goods and people was something that was a, a big part of his life. So they sit down. Uh, look, let, me, let, me, let, me, let, me, let me ask you a question. Yeah. So look at the painting. The dude behind Grant, he's got a real beard. Do you know who that is? is it, I mean, what a manly, you know what, what a I, manly beard, what a manly beard that is. I mean, it looks like the Smith Brothers corp drops. And the guy, the guy <laughs> behind him looks like a, looks like a Neanderthal. You, you, you know, look at that, look at the face. Actually, one of them, um, important fact, one of them was a Native American, was, was an Indian, uh, uh, who I think was the guy who wrote the terms. So here, even Grant is giving like he's giving, um, you know, recognition that competence matters here. Uh, again, we'll talk more about uh, next week about his idea of with 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 the Indians that assimilation was a major th- that was the thing that he wanted yeah. uh, of everyone of of the blacks and just full assimilation to this free society that right, we uphold. Right. Yeah, no, Grant was a Grant was a good man in, in that regard. And you see his generosity yeah. to Lee's to Lee's troops because Lee requested that his men be allowed to keep their horses, right? Which is important. You're going back to the South, going back to Georgia. That's what I'm yeah, you're that's exactly my, my oh, next point. They sit oh, yeah, down. I'm sorry, I'm sorry, I'm sorry, go ahead. No, 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 that's okay, Anthony. You you're absolutely so they sit down and instead of jumping right into business, Grant reminds Lee, we served at West Point. We served, you don't remember me because you're older and more established and, and, but I remember you, we served in the Mexican war together at West Point mm-hmm. and, and Lee actually wasn't even aware of that. Like, you know, he, when you're a star and the other person is, is not, you know, decades earlier, that's not necessarily on, on your radar. And then Lee is the one who comes to business 
and says the terms exactly what you said let them keep their horses as long as they stay by the law and don't you know uh, further rebel and actually speaking of rebellion in his memoirs he never calls it grant never calls it the civil war he calls it the war of the rebellion okay, okay. and i think that's important as well because they broke off they were fighting america he, yeah, you know right, his point right. was they were fighting america but after the terms are agreed he t grant tells his own troops the war is over the rebels are our countrymen again so right. feed them let them go home and it's like no jubilation you can't celebrate in front of them you can't in your face the way today's athletes do you know yeah. regularly you can't, when, can't when talk smack no. can't talk smack to no. the to the defeated confederate soldiers right no no, no. yeah no it's, gener it's generous so his humanity really right yeah he realized the Southerners, you know, it was still an agrarian out. society. They need their horses, you know, to till the fields. Yeah. Yep. Exactly. So and just Lincoln to get around, it's not like, not like a lot of the Union troops may have come from New York or Chicago. You know, they, they don't need their horses as yeah. much. But in Georgia, you know, or Alabama, yeah. you know, wherever these Confederate troops are from, they need their horses just for transportation as, as well as to totally. you know, work the fields. Yeah. Totally. Yeah. So um, Lincoln hears the news. It, the news makes it to Washington, D.C. There is jubilation there. And Lincoln's like three cheers for General Grant. You know, the, the, this is it. We're, we finally, you know, the jubilation in the North uh, and in finally, the South, yeah, there's actually finally. relief. There's relief so, that, yeah, they can now go somewhat go back to, the, to their own lives. Yeah, and, our boys can come home and they won't be killed anymore. And then, uh, sadly, five days later, <clears throat> uh, Lincoln, uh, Grant is in D.C. with Lincoln. They're doing, po you know, post-war uh, meetings. And Lincoln wants a night out at the theater to enjoy himself and invites Grant and his wife to join. And um, I can't verify this, but I think his wife, Julia, did not like Mary Todd. So she basically said, look, don't, we're not going, we're going home to Philly to see our kids. And so Grant basically says, no, we, we can't make it uh, tonight at the theater, which clearly was a, a good decision because there was <clears throat> certainly an assassination attempt planned for Grant as well as uh lincoln you know there, there were many uh, seward got got injured there, there were many northerners who uh this assassination plot was meant uh to to kill <clears throat> and at the funeral uh several days later grant is openly weeping and that's as you mentioned earlier that's when he said uh abraham lincoln is the greatest man i've ever known so right. the war is over North has won, but Lincoln's dead. So what will happen next? The the new president, Andrew Johnson, is from the South because Lincoln yeah, he's a, had he's Johnson a Southern run Democrat as the vice from president Tennessee. in order to yeah, Southern in order Democrat to from Tennessee, right? the, the, right. the South. Yeah, yeah. And that was you know, that ended up being uh not you know, not a good call. Yeah, that didn't go well with the Republican Congress who wanted to impose harsh terms, you know, during during Reconstruction. Yes, and the bitter irony yeah. of this, Robert, is that it, it it probably was very much in the long-term rational self-interest of the South for Lincoln to have remained alive and president, because given who he was and what his principles were, yeah. he most likely would have been far more lenient towards uh towards the former rebels than a lot of the uh, radical yeah. ra radical republicans in, in congress so mm -hmm. it was really detrimental to the south's well-being for lincoln to be mm -hmm. assassinated and, and by a southern sympathizer yeah yeah unfortunate but you know again if we look at if we look at the trajectory of grant's life in 1860 he is a failure working underneath his two younger brothers as a clerk you know selling goods in a tannery and within you know two years household name the expression unconditional surrender 
within um, five years, defeats the South, slavery's over, and we're ready for the next phase of his life. And I so and I just I just want to yeah. say one thing. Yeah, let me. Uh, I just happen to have a copy of this book. <laughs> yes. <laughs> <laughs> heroes heroes legends champions heroes legends champions yeah. yeah that's right um and there's a, i think there's a point here that's applicable because there's a lot of people who uh you know basically in their attitudes non-heroic or even anti-heroic who say who say well the the times make the man you know so they, 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 you need a calamity you know like churchill was a failure yeah. in, in a number of ways before uh he you know he became prime minister yeah. Around the around the time of Dunkirk, and it was uh, was darkest hour. As well. Yeah, yeah, yep. darkest hour for for Britain. Yeah, Patton, Grant. But I think the truth is the truth is if you really look at heroes and look at history, first of all, no era lacks for turbulence or calamities. Every every year it has its equivalent of slavery or Hitler or massive pandemics or you know or you know or, or what have you. And it's and it's the hero who who yeah those those circumstances are are out there. That's not something that he created, but the hero rises to the occasion. He takes he takes the calamity yes. you know by the scruff of the neck, and he and he, you know and and he and he shakes it and makes it you know and makes it turn out. Uh, you know, it, 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 he brings it to some uh, conclusion that supports human life. You know, and and so Grant yes. certainly seized the the horrors of the war. Provided him an opportunity, but he seized that opportunity. He rose to the occasion. He performed heroically, you know, on the battlefield, and he helped. Uh, he and Sherman both, you know, were, were instrumental. Because mm -hmm. the former Northern generals, prior to Grant and Sherman, as we discussed, you know, on the Hero Show, where we discussed Sherman, were not capable. They were not able to defeat yeah. Lee or defeat Southern commanders generally. It took great military commanders like Grant and Sherman uh, to do it. So heroes, yes. heroes. Uh, may depend upon external circumstances you know to provide them an opportunity like churchill did or like george washington mm -hmm. did but heroes mm -hmm. rise to the occasion and they they seize you know they seize those opportunities you know and that's uh, that's yeah. the, the that's that's volitional that's their choice their their You're own right. decisions their rational thinking that's their responsibility and that's that's why we properly yeah. honor them as as heroes yeah I agree, Andy. And the only thing I piggyback on is the adversity also that they, I mean, you mentioned like whatever the, whatever the circumstances of the times they fight with, but even human nature, <clears throat> uh, Grant was undercut by his superiors. You know, he was, he, he dealt with alcohol problems early and owned up to it. But when he started rising, his, his superiors who were definitely not as capable of him there was envy there and so then they they smeared him with this you know with with these terms of no he's a drunkard and that's where men like lincoln were like he fights i can't i can't i can't change it he, yeah. he fights and you know so so the 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 arc of not only failing at business after business um throughout his life uh, which I think also was a factor in the terms, in the lenient terms he gave Lee and Lee's army, uh, was they just failed. So here again, I think his humanity, and this is not altruism, this is humanity, like in the proper sense, he knows what failure is like, and they just want to go home, and they want to resume their lives. And so the fact that he had failed himself often gave him that similarity to them and granted them that leniency that, as you said, Lincoln very likely would have continued yeah. uh, had he lived. But for all right. these reasons and many more, right. and which we'll get to. Yeah, and this yeah, was one thing before, before we start off. You're right, it's not altruism. It's not self-sacrificial. It's in the rash, long-term rational self-interest of the North because the less bitterness and the less resentment you could leave the you know there's yeah. got to be some after this brutal war but you know take your horses go home go back to your families go back to your farms or whatever you know whatever your business yeah. is you free you free your free men you know, as long as you don't rebel anymore break the law you know you're, you're, you're free men the less 
bitterness and the less resentment that can be engendered amongst these southern these southern veterans, the more likely that reconstruction can go uh, peacefully and, and ten years down the road or whatever we can have a rehabilitated country. Yeah. You know, one one country again, uh, free country now with without slaves. And uh, I think this it's the, I, I, so I think that kind of lenience, you know, rational lenience here towards the defeated southern veterans is in the self-interest of the North and, and the United States as a whole. And I think Grant and Lincoln both recognize that. Yeah. And again, what does Grant say? They are now, are they're no longer rebels. They're right. our countrymen, you know, right. and, and right. so let's I think that unify. Was right. That was Lincoln's attitude also. Yeah. Yeah. It's one been, reason they, they admired each other. Yeah. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Right. Right. Yeah. So, well, part one. I, I, Draw here, yeah. And next week, part two, uh, we'll we'll, do we'll part talk two. Why the man made it to <laughs> fifty dollar bills? Is he is he ten times better than Lincoln? I'm not sure economically, maybe, but <laughs> <laughs> right. Well, the hundred hundred is referred to as a Benjamin, right? He gives like that's true. You know, that's true. Yeah, I gave four hundred dollars. I'll tell you if you're talking about denominations, Andy. But for like 10 minutes, my favorite president was Woodrow Wilson, because I looked in the encyclopedia, I was like eight, nine years old, and I saw Wilson was on the $100,000 bill. And I was like, wow, that's my, he's my favorite now. Yeah, yeah 10 minutes, yeah. <laughs> you I learned 10 about, minutes him. about him. Because he was a disaster, you know, a Southern, he was, he was a racist, uh, you know. But anyway, we, yeah, we're not, yeah. we, could do, we could do an episode on Wilson on the villain show, uh, which, which would be yeah, appropriate. True, true. He was a real racist. But, but yeah, uh, but yeah. Uh, thank you, Grant. Right. Part one. Right. And so next week, Grant's presidency, we will look at, which uh, I, uh, I'm not an American historian, but the little I know about, it, I think Grant's presidency was has been underrated. There's a there's a lot of yeah. there's a lot of really good things that Grant accomplished as, as a two term. Knocking president. out the KKK, definitely. That's always uh, that's always a good thing. Indians. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. Yeah. A legacy for sure, and then telling his memoirs uh, and finishing, yes. you know, finishing his book a few days before his uh, he passes away. So, yep, yeah, to be continued. So, I mean, yes, and so I want to salute your know, unconditional surrender grant for unconditional helping to surrender. win. <laughs> you know, a big part in winning the Civil War and reestablishing the United States as a free as a free country. Yes. Uh, and uh, next week, well, well, yeah, I mean, the United States was only a, prior to the Civil War was only you know half free. Half the country was a slave society, but after That's Lincoln right. and Grant, yep. and after Lincoln and Grant and Sherman, the United States became uh, a free country. Period. So uh, we are yes. we honor Grant for that. We'll, we'll continue our discussion of Grant's achievements uh, as president. Uh, we'll look, look at his achievements as president next week. And so Robert and everybody out there in hero land, I want to wish you have a, have a heroic day and let's all try to, let's all strive to lead more heroic lives. We'll see you next week, everybody on the hero show. Perfect. Thank you, Andy. You too.